Would they please leave as quickly as possible? I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 27 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator McCarthy. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The need for the Morrison government to explain how rebadging in its, its inadequate loan scheme is good enough for tens of thousands of struggling small businesses that will face the impact of JobKeeper cuts on 28 March. Is the proposal supported? The proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And I call on Senator O'Neill. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Acting Deputy President. And, uh, I, I take the opportunity to congratulate Senator McCarthy for uh, submitting this uh, matter for public, of public interest for discussion this afternoon. The matter of public interest is the government's callous withdrawal of job seeker and job keeper and its particular effect on my home region of the New South Wales Central Coast. The COVID-19 pandemic has created a two-track economy. At business forums that I've been hosting around the Central Coast, I've been delighted to hear that local manufacturers such as the bin company Sulo have been going gangbusters and are desperate for extra trained staff. Other businesses in our world-class tourism, arts and events sector are doing far, far worse. And this is indeed a reflection of the profound patchiness of the recovery of some jobs and also indications of further major problems from this government about the capacity for people who need to employ to be able to find workers to do the work that they need. And that's a, a, a litany of failures that have led to that reality in the country. JobKeeper was a vital part of the stimulus that halted the economic wrecking ball that COVID initially threatened. It was part of a stimulus that government, labour and the union movement all worked together uh, on a rare, in a rare act of bipartisanship. Now, the vital stimulus of the same kind that the Liberal and the National parties railed against in the GFC when Labor did it, but I would rather them be hypocrites than do the wrong thing for the country. They didn't want to do it. They didn't want to support JobKeeper and JobSeeker, but ultimately they pushed the panic button, recalled the parliament and responded to Labor's leadership on this matter. At the height of the pandemic, the payments were sent out to 3.5 uh, million workers, and that's nearly a third of the national workforce. And it was done so to keep workers tied to their workforce. Around 11,000 local businesses on the central coast of New South Wales uh, are actually receiving JobKeeper. Now, 11,000 businesses is 47% of all businesses on the Central Coast, so nearly half the businesses on JobKeeper. That means that thousands of Central Coast jobs are at risk when Scott Morrison and Mr Josh Frydenberg pull the rug out from under those businesses in just 11 days. In New South Wales, the New South Wales Business Chamber has reported that across the state, 23 per cent of businesses that they surveyed believe they were at high risk of failure when supports such as JobKeeper ended. But you would never know that from the sort of answers to questions we had today here in the chamber. But that just further reflects a government completely out of touch with the reality of small businesses under incredible pressure. The businesses that are most likely to go under are indeed those small and medium enterprises which pre-COVID-19 were the engine room of the Australian economy and more particularly on the Central Coast, our great local employers. Independent economist Nikki Hutley thinks 100,000 jobs could be lost as a result of the JobKeeper cuts, which would also take around $5 billion out of the economy. 
Deloitte Access Economics also reported that around 40 per cent, 40 per cent of all businesses in the hospitality, professional services and transport sectors do not have the cash reserves to cover more than three months of operation in the current environment. Now, this clearly, for anybody who understands small business, is an unsustainable situation. And there are particular industries that we absolutely need to save. But this government has failed to do the work to locate the pressure points and deliver what is needed for small businesses across this country in any way that actually meets the demand. On February the 12th of this year, I visited the historic Avoca Beach Picture Theatre to speak to the wonderful owners, our local legends Beth and Norman Hunter. I spoke with them about the drastic effects of COVID-19 on their business and indeed on all independent cinemas across the industry. They told me they were terrified about the effects of cancellation of JobKeeper on their 30 staff members and their complaints to the government across the nation for the sector continue to fall on deaf ears. They weren't just advocating for themselves, they were advocating for cinemas right across this country. We need to do far more to support local and independent cin cinemas. There's been no case of COVID-19 worldwide that's been contracted in a movie theatre. And we need to support our local cinemas and local industries that are doing it tough. So, if you haven't been to the movies in a while, Senators, I encourage you all to do so. Support a local cinema. They need your assistance. On that same day, I also had the privilege to visit EI Productions, a proud, family-run local business in West Gosford that provides expert lighting, lighting and technical expertise to live music productions. If you've been to a fantastic concert from a major Australian or international band, pretty good chance that they were the ones who did the lighting and sound and gave you a great show. Pre-pandemic, this business, based on the local, in my local area on the Central Coast, was one of the top performers in its field in Australia. But the shutdown of the live music industry and global travel have left this once bustling business absolutely struggling. It's exactly the kind of business that JobKeeper was created to protect and is now being abandoned by this government. It was a competitive industry leader, brought low, not by willful neglect or poor business techniques, but by a once-in-a-generation pandemic that crippled their specific industry. The government needs to listen. The government needs to support exactly these kinds of local businesses. The government needs to extend JobKeeper to hard-working Australians like Caroline and Neil Mace. The industry group representing the New South Wales events industry, Save New South Wales Events, surveyed their industry recently, and they found out what the government couldn't hear. That is that 95 per cent of those businesses were on JobKeeper. The whole industry has declined to the tune of almost 82 per cent from April to December 2020. The survey reported that 45 per cent of those companies will lay off staff, 42 per cent will have to close their doors when this government rips JobKeeper away. What they need is targeted support to keep their doors open till better times arrive. We cannot allow the two-track economy to continue, otherwise we're going to have an incredible loss of capacity and devastation of uh, job loss for those people who simply have nowhere to go and put their great skills to work. What the government's decided to do to these businesses that have been struggling for more than 12 months with this massive downturn is to give them another layer of debt, another layer of debt, offering them loans instead of the support that they need right now. While it's better than nothing, it's going to mean that businesses taking on further debt to survive, with the vaccine rollout far away and increasing variants on the virus, will be forced by this government to take on liabilities in an increasingly insecure environment. These loans may even be rejected by banks 
on, the risk, on risk grounds, leaving the businesses with no support whatsoever. And the government's got pretty poor form on organising loan programs. The last one was so poorly organised that it promoted and promoted that it only 5 per cent of the funds went out the door. But they announce a big sum, get the big you know, razzle-dazzle announcement out of the way, and then the disaster follows behind closed doors. And that's what they keep getting away with. But time's up. This sort of action isn't sufficient. It isn't smart policy. It isn't right. The data is there. The indicators are there. The peaks of the, the industries that are at risk are revealing the shape of need for small business in this country. But this government is blind and deaf when it comes to that and refuses to respond. Mr Morrison's government is not listening and the invisible member Lucy Wicks have shut down the Edelong Centrelink office at this time, knowing for over two years that the lease was ending. They didn't find another location and instead they let the centre go. Now this is a gut punch to people on the peninsula at a time when they absolutely need it. We're approaching a cliff on March the 31st with job people withdrawn, this government, who closed a Centrelink office, will, be, will bring businesses Senator to the brink your of time disaster. Has expired. Senator Renick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. Well, well, well. The fox is in the hen house. The fox is in the hen house. Here we go. We've got Labor suddenly worried about small business. Get real. I mean, this is the fox that wants to destroy small business. This is the party that wants higher taxes. This is the party. This is the party that wants higher energy prices. I just put forward a motion then to support nuclear energy, which would give us clean, green, baseload energy. No. What do they do? They want to vote against it. Another way to lower energy costs. I mean, if the Labor Party were really serious about small business, they'd vote with us on these IR reforms, which would help improve flexibility and give employees and employers the opportunity to get back to work. But no, not the Labor Party. And let's look at the Labor state premiers. What have they done? They have destroyed confidence. They have destroyed confidence. And instead, they have replaced it with fear. And they have used COVID as a method to command and control. To mark command and control. And that is Labor's modus operandi all the time is to instill fear into everyone. Well, I happen to know someone from the music industry. I've been talking to them very closely. They need open borders, number one, and they need consistent restrictions, number two, and they need some of those restrictions lifted. Because when you've got restrictions that vary between state to state, people aren't going to travel because they don't know. They don't know if they're going to get back home. Okay? They don't know if they're going to get back home. Uh, so, you know, to, just to listen to the Labor Party keep going on about how you know, businesses are going to hit the wall, how we don't really care, can I say it's an insult. And they're trying to attack here the coalition. They're trying to attack the coalition, but I'll tell you who they're really attacking. They're attacking the taxpayer. Because in the last 12 months, the taxpayer has forked out a total of $250 billion, $250 billion to support small business and their employees. Right? Now, at some point, and this is what Labor don't seem to understand, we have to start moving forward. JobKeeper and JobSeeker were all about protecting people while we locked down to get on top of COVID. Right? That was in order to stay locked down. Now that we're on top of COVID, okay, we have to open up. We have to increase activity. We have to increase activity. Now, when Senator O'Neill stands there and says we don't listen, we have been listening. And the overall feedback we've been getting from employers is that they can't get employees back to work. And a part of the reason for that is that a lot of employees have stayed home because of job seeker or job keeper. Right? Well, out there in regional Queensland, they are screaming out for work. They are screaming out for uh, employees. And while we continue to keep job seeker and job keeper going, it's going to encourage people to stay at home. So now we need to get people back to work. And, and we accept there's going to be an adjustment here somewhere, um, but we stand committed to supporting both employees and employers in Australia. But what we won't take is the other side, Labor, who are all about fear and negativity. Because I tell you what business rely on most, and that is confidence. It is all about confidence. 
And while we have Labor Party over there constantly talking down the economy, constantly talking down the government, constantly talking down our recovery, constantly talking down how bad everything is, you know, they're, they're going after, they're making personal smears, all the rest of it, that destroys confidence. That destroys confidence. And that is the difference between this side of the chamber and that side of the chamber. This, this side of the chamber, we're optimists. We're positive. We're glass half full people. We're not all that negative, dreary, oh, the world's falling in. No, no. We say get out from under the doona. Get out there, enjoy the sunshine, and let's get on with it. Let's get on with it. But you know, I've got talking points here, and I actually couldn't actually, I didn't bother printing them all off because there's 16 pages of talking points about just how much we have supported small business in the last 12 months and, to be quite frank, since the start, the start of this country. I mean, our whole uh, party was founded on the Forgotten People speech, was all about small business. Because we on this side of the chamber understand that small business is the heart of capitalism. Small business is the heart of individualism. Small business is the heart of autonomy, independence, freedom, making up your own mind, choosing what you want to do with your life. Okay, if it wasn't for small business are the backbone of this economy. And we have stood here shoulder to shoulder with small business to make sure that they survive. To make sure that they survive. And for the fox to come in here into their hen house and pretend that bark, 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 they're chickens too. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. We can see the fox here. And it is on that side of the chamber. It is on that side of the chamber because the Labor Party hates small business. They have always imposed more regulation. They have sold the infrastructure that small business relies on to provide them cheap energy, cheap water. I mean, you've only got to look at the state Labor government and what they've done. They've sold all our infrastructure off to foreign owners. They won't build dams. Not only do they not build dams, they tear dams down. They've shut down small uh, maternity wards in regional Queensland. So the people and farmers now, they, they don't want to go to regional Queensland. You won't get doctors going to regional Queensland. I was at the rural doctors' lunch yesterday, and the rural doctors were saying how Families just won't move to regional towns because they don't want to go to a town where there's no um, good health services. And you know, you've only got to look at Queensland Labor's record in shutting down over 30 maternity wards, 30 maternity wards, many in towns that have now had populations that are bigger, that are bigger, to know that Labor do not care about the little guy. I'll make an exception for Senator Sheldon and Senator Stirl. I know those two guys care about the little guy. But as for the left wing of the party, they're all about telling the small business how to live their life, what they should be doing, and increasing regulation and increasing taxes. That is not the way forward. That is not the way forward. So I'm going to read out all the support that the coalition government has provided to small business. Has provided to small business. For a start. Well, we don't have enough time. We don't have enough time. I mean, I'd have to uh, move a motion to get the rest of the whole MPI time to go through it. Um, I'll, go, I'll go through a couple of pages. There's 16 pages here, but there are billions, billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars in support, courtesy of the taxpayer, who just happens to be small business, and courtesy, of, co of course, to our children, who are going to have to pay some of this COVID debt off, which is why we need to get business moving forward again so that we start paying the debt off and don't leave it to our children. We don't leave it to our children. Now, it's the coalition government. It's the coalition government that has cut the tax rate for small and medium business from 27.5% to 26%. To 26%. We've got a long way to go because withholding tax rates, we've got to lift. I'm working on that one. Don't worry. Uh, what else have we done? We've increased. We've uh, also uh, accelerated personal income tax. Now, that matters because I'll tell you why. The lower income tax is for uh, individuals. When you give a pay rise, that's more money they get to keep in their pocket. Yeah. So that, that is a future benefit that flows through to the economy. Now we've also expanded small business tax concessions. Small business tax concessions. Small business now can get an immediate write-off of 150 grand. I know farmers uh, especially like that one because they can go and buy a new tractor or a new fertile, uh, new plough or uh, whatever. So. That's a really, really good one. Uh, as well as that, we've uh, simplified our credit framework, uh, improved access to finance. Uh, we've small, been supporting small business research and development, increasing the refundable research and development tax offset 
from uh, to 18.5 per cent and removing the annual cash refund cap for small claim, uh, claimants. Uh, the other thing we've done is we've reformed Australia's insolvency framework. We've enabled small business to get paid faster by introducing payment times reporting framework and the procurement connected policy. Now that is really, really important because it is incredibly important that small business gets paid as quickly as possible to keep the cash rolling in. We've supported small business with tax disputes. We've pushed back on the ATO. Like all bureaucrats, they tend to get a bit uh, carried away and a bit Orwellian and, and dystopian in the way they like to uh, bully small business around. We've said that's enough's enough, boys. Just remember who's paying your wages. We've reduced regulation and compliance tax uh, costs. We've increased digital capability. Uh, we've invested in the mental health of business owners. We've worked to get our workplace relations settings right, which is with these uh, industrial relations laws, which are going to actually give more flexibility to both the employer and the employee. We've encouraged Australians to go local first. We've got to keep working on that. We need to do more work there, but we will go and do that. Uh, and we've, worked, we've also, we've also, and this is the one. Uh, I just want to uh, run this loan through. We've offered get a load of this. Where is it? Can't find it. It's over on this page. Um, now, this recovery scheme, Senator we've increased Rennie, the split from 50. Your time okay, has right. expired. Senator, expired. Senator McKean. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, buried in that load of tripe from Senator Rennick was an admission that we're facing a massive austerity budget coming down the line. And as we know, austerity doesn't work. And of course, it is the poorest of Australians who suffer the most under our Liberal austerity budgets. Now, reports that the government is planning to extend their small business loans is yet another example of this government looking extremely busy but actually not doing very much. I want to be really clear. There is, of course, merit in extending the scheme. Many small businesses are likely to continue to struggle, and all the more so once JobKeeper finishes at the end of this month. But if the government or Senator Rennick uh, would be interested in this, I feel, if the government actually wanted to help small businesses, then they'd go to one of the root causes of the problem, that Australia's financial system, aided and abetted by the big corporate banks, is rigged in favour of housing. Over the last 30 years, banks have gone from lending twice as much money to businesses as they did for housing to now lending twice as much money for housing as they do to businesses. Now, under the reign of the neoliberals, Australia's financial system has gone from one that served the real economy by provi providing loans for productive enterprise to one that serves the speculators in the housing market by providing even larger loans for those investing in ever-increasing house prices. The Productivity Commission undertook an exten extensive inquiry into competition in the financial system just three years ago and it found this. The reform that would most significantly improve small to medium enterprise access to finance would be changes to the underlying prudential requirements for SME lending compared with lending for residential mortgages. So there you have it. In other words, fix the financial system so it's not rigged in favour of housing speculators. That's what we should be doing. Make it so that the banks aren't able to lend so much more against their capital holdings for housing as they are for small businesses. And that would help put some balance back in the financial system and our economy in favour of people who are actually doing something with the money they lent rather than betting and speculating on ever-increasing house prices. Now, it's not surprising that the government's small business loan scheme has been undersubscribed, but there is uh, no such issue in the housing market, I can assure you. Over the last 12 months, consumer lending for housing grew 44 per cent, the highest rise over any 12-month period on record. In part, this is thanks to the RBA's ambivalence about the flow of credit. What has happened is this. The RBA has printed hundreds of billions of new dollars, pumped it into the financial system and said to the banks, basically, you can do what you like with it. And not surprisingly, with spending down and business confidence low, the banks have gone, oh, well, we'll stick that money into the housing market. I mean, no wonder an entire generation of young people are being priced out of the great Australian dream of owning their own, help, uh, owning their own home. But even that is not enough for the LNP in here and their corporate 
banking masters, despite the largest increase in consumer lending on record, an increase in risky lending, according to APRA figures released just yesterday, the government has introduced legislation to abolish responsible lending laws to make it even easier for the banks to lend even more money. This government and their corporate banking masters want even more money to flow into one of the most overpriced housing markets on the planet. Like just about everything this government has done in response to the pandemic, their plans to rip up responsible lending laws are firstly all about helping their big corporate mates, secondly leaving ordinary Australians to fend for themselves, and that of course includes small business. What small business really needs is the same as what everyone else needs, which is for the LNP to stop acting as agents of the big corporate banks in this place. What we need is for the rules in the financial system and the tax system to be rewritten so that we reward and support productive enterprise and the rapid transition to a zero carbon future, and we stop rewarding and stop supporting financialised capitalism and all of the other corporate rent seekers who will not stop until they have taken control of every corner of our economic system. Uh, Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President, and uh, I sort of want to sort of thank Senator McKim for his contribution, uh, considering the one that we had earlier from um, Senator Rennick. Um, I, look, I also rise to speak on this matter of public importance that's been been brought before the Senate today, and surely just uh, a few days away from this government's premature ending of JobKeeper, and this matter could not be of any more public importance than it is right now. Over the course of the last 12 months, JobKeeper has been a lifeline for millions of Australians right around the country. This time last year, as many of our fellow Australians faced the prospect of losing their livelihoods, to have JobKeeper there to support them at that time could not have been more important. As important as it was then, it remains so now. Whilst it is certainly the case that in some areas of the economy there has been a steady transition towards relative normality, for many the future continues to remain uncertain. In fact, in my home state of Victoria, the premature ending of JobKeeper is estimated to impact upon 134,000 businesses employing around 413,000 workers. Almost half a million workers, Madam Acting Deputy President, in my state alone. Now, for those 413,000 workers, the same concerns they had this time last year persist today. For those workers transitioning to, relatively normal, to relative normality, like others, may have been fortunate to do, but it is not an option. Some of them may work in retail, in hospitality, restaurants, in tourism, but these are by no means the extent of it. Many, many other industries then those will find themselves affected by this decision by the coalition government. And that is because for them, the recovery, such as it is, is still yet to be realised. For them, the shocks of the COVID-19 pandemic remain. And this could be no more than the case in my home state, where the pandemic has brought quite profound disruption. Whilst those in other states were at bars, at cafes and restaurants, roaming their regions or simply getting on with their lives as best as they could, Victorians, through no fault of their own, were mostly confined to their homes, only in rare instances permitted to even stray just five kilometres beyond. Now, I was obviously one of those Victorians, and take it from me, 
the economic effects of this remain. The support that was put in place, particularly of JobKeeper, continues to be welcome and it is quite frankly needed. One must ask themselves what could possibly possess this government to think that cutting the safety net for these workers whilst they still remain laying in, in it is a good idea. You know, we've heard from other members across the aisle justification after justification, but the reality is there are people who will do it tough, who will struggle, who need that support from their government. That is why they pay their taxes and they look up to government. They are looking to, up to all of us here in Canberra, wanting that support. What kind of government would seek to throw 413,418 working families into financial peril? But I suppose when one ponders the question, it should hardly be surprising that we see this government, this coalition government of all governments, seeking to undertake such an action. Of course, let us in this place and this country not forget that JobKeeper was never a proposal that those opposite were prepared to embrace. In fact, it, when it was initially proposed by those in the Labor movement, by those on my side of the chamber and the crossbench, it was dismissed out hand by this government. Let me quote from the Prime Minister, who on the 25th of March last year said, the best way to get help to people is through the existing payment channels. To dream up other schemes can be very dangerous. Dangerous is what the Prime Minister said. What Australian workers saw as a life jacket in a stormy sea, the Prime Minister saw as dangerous. Well, as we have seen, JobKeeper has been anything but dangerous. Rather, it's been one of the most positive things to have come out of this place in quite some time. Thank goodness those beside me and around me, those in the community, never gave up on the fight on its establishment. And thank goodness that together we were able to successfully drag this government to the table. Because it is owing to those efforts that so many have been able to rely on the support they needed to get through. Now, these are the essential workers who every morning would get up, make sure that our supermarket shelves were stocked, our nurses on the front line at hospitals, making sure that people got tested for COVID. Now, these are the very people who rely on this payment. And it may not even be those people could also be people that they live and share their homes with as well. It is because of many of the efforts being put in place that so many businesses, and in particular small businesses, have remained afloat and so many workers remain connected to their place of work. And that is a good thing, being able to provide for their families, being able to support the many local businesses, which are probably supported by families and support their local communities in regional Australia. But what remains the question for, for us and for those who still require such assistance is what is to become of them? I note that the coalition government has recently unveiled its SME recovery loan scheme. And for those listening and who are unfamiliar with the our SME recovery loan scheme. This is an initiative in which the government will seek to work with lenders to ensure that certain eligible businesses will have access to finance to get them through the many tough times ahead. No matter how this coalition government might seek to dress up this scheme, it is by no means a like for, for like swap with JobKeeper. And I can assure you that if you were the owner of a small or medium-sized business, or indeed a worker in one of those small or medium-sized businesses, 
you would by no means be looking forward to what is to come in just 11 days' time, when JobKeeper is scrapped. We know just how important that certainty is to business, big or small. And I don't think you would have to convince anyone of just how important it is that when it comes to the coronavirus pandemic, that we get the recovery right. Indeed, how we get out of this is crucial to guaranteeing our nation's future economic prosperity. Because at the end of the day, that is all that we want. The success of Australian business is central to this. And I know, for instance, that Labor's Shadow Minister for Small Business, Matt Keogh, has spoken at length with business owners from all around the country about their concerns. Should the government persist in scrapping JobKeeper without the provision of targeted additional measures, many of these businesses will close. And this will have an effect not just on the businesses concerned and those directly employed by them, but on other businesses that might rely on those too and the indirect jobs that may be lost. Now, Labor has certainly made its own suggestions about what the government might do to improve JobKeeper. We have sought to work constructively with those opposite. Sadly, the government has not been forthcoming on this and instead, in conjunction with other proposed legislative changes before this place, has sought to maintain an on ongoing ideological crusade against working Senator people. Senator Ciccone, your time has expired. Senator Abetz. Labor's relentless negativity appears to know no bounds, and today's matter of public importance put forward by Senator McCarthy is another example of this relentless negativity. Labor's newfound interest in small business is welcome, but like all of Labor's business statements, there's no actual substance or actual policy initiative that is put forward. It is just criticism after criticism after criticism. On the one hand, Labor tells us, and might I add quite rightly, in a rare lucid moment, the JobKeeper needed to be rolled back. As we announced JobKeeper, we said it would be a temporary measure to assist us through the immediate crisis, would be tapered off and then would need to be stopped. Labor actually agreed with that at one stage in one of their rare lucid moments in this space. But of course it doesn't take them long to try to play the populist card, the relentless negativity, and somehow suggest that the money for JobKeeper can just keep flowing and flowing. The Australian Labor Party and the Australian Greens don't seem to recognise that through this pandemic, huge borrowings have been undertaken, massive borrowings, all of which need to be repaid, and repaid, I suggest, by the next generation, and chances are the generation after that. And therefore, we have to be exceptionally circumspect to ensure that the debt burden inflicted on the next generation, or generations plural, is as limited as possible. Because to do otherwise would be intergenerational theft, and this parliament would be abrogating its duty and its responsibility to the next generations. The motion that we have before us, or the topic we have before us, is this sort of glib dismissal of our small and medium enterprise support scheme. The motion says that somehow all we've done is rebadge it without dealing with the significant measures that are contained therein to ensure that our small and medium enterprises, the ones that we on this side seek to champion, are able to be maintained. Because small and medium enterprises, employers as they are, are called employers for a very simple reason. They employ people, and jobs are the lifeblood of our community. Jobs provide the individuals who have those jobs with better mental health, physical health, 
self-esteem and social interaction outcomes and for everybody that lives in a household with somebody that is gainfully employed. And so, in pursuing our economic measures, it is not because we believe in economic purity that we so pursue them. We pursue them because of the social dividend that is delivered by good, sound economic management. And I must say it was somewhat galling to have to listen to Senator McKim, who was one of the failed ministers of the Green Labor government in my home state of Tasmania, that left its economy as a smoking ruin in recession. In recession. But with the election of the Abbott government and then the Hodgman government, Tasmania has been able to go from recession to the turnaround state and today the standout state. These things don't happen by accident. Recessions occur usually because of bad economic management. The turnaround has occurred because of good economic management by Prime Minister Abbott and Premier Hodgman, built on now by Prime Minister Morrison and Premier Gutwin. But we were told as well by the Green contribution that somehow the financial sector was rigged in favour of the housing sector. Well, if it's rigged in favour of the housing sector, one assumes more and more houses are being built. And if it wasn't so rigged, as Senator McKim describes it, there would be less houses built. But how often do the Greens issue their press releases like confetti complaining about homelessness and the lack of housing availability? They really have this capacity, as is the want of the left in this country and indeed elsewhere, to talk out of both sides of their mouth. On the one side, they say there's a housing crisis, we need more houses. On the other side, when it suits them, they say the financial system is skewed in favour of creating housing, too much housing. I don't care what your story is, just keep it consistent. Give us an actual position on these matters. You can't one day or you can't claim credibility in this space and assert there aren't enough houses and then simultaneously assert that too many houses are being built. And so uh, I turn to Senator Ciccone's contribution, which started by, not surprisingly, thanking the Green contribution. The Labor Party and the Greens cannot help themselves. They continue to be in lockstep, especially when it comes to bad economic management. I don't know what the attraction is, but it is a fatal attraction, and we have seen the results in my home state of Tasmania, and I would never want to see it inflicted at the national level. But in the moments remaining, that which the Labor Party seek to dismiss a simple rebadging includes such things as allow, uh, having the SME recovery loan scheme increasing from the current 50-50 split between the government and the banks to an 80-20 split, which will encourage more banks to support small businesses and demonstrates the government's commitment to back those businesses that are prepared to back themselves. Clear, good, positive policy, simply dismissed by those economic illiterates on the other side as rebadging. I dare say they use that terminology because they don't understand the significance and importance and value of these sort of initiatives. The expanded scheme will also increase the size of eligible loans from one million under the current scheme to five million and maximum eligible turnover increased from 50 to $250 million. In anybody's language, significant changes to the scheme simply and ignorantly dismissed as rebadging. Is it really the case that Labor don't understand or they haven't looked to the significance of these policy changes? 
Similarly, the maximum loan terms under the expanded scheme will be increased from five to ten years, providing businesses and lenders with greater flexibility and certainty. The expanded scheme will also allow lenders to offer borrowers a repayment holiday of up to 24 months. All of these fantastic initiatives simply dismissed as rebadging. The scheme also will also be able to be used by eligible businesses to refinance existing loans. Another great assistance. This allows SMEs to access more concessional interest rates available under the program and to better manage their cash flows through an extended loan term and lower combined repayments. These are targeted, focused enhancements with real outcomes, simply dismissed by Labor as rebadging. You really can't take the mob opposite seriously when it comes to economic management, which in turn means employment and self-sufficiency for our fellow Australians. You've got to give it to the Labor Party. When it comes to spin, chances are there's no one better. But when it comes to sound economic policy, that is where they are found wanting. The Australian people are awake to them. They understand that the JobKeeper funding cannot keep going, but they do know that the fundamental underpinnings required for SMEs to keep them in employment is required, and that is what we are delivering. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. To the millions of Australians out there who have received JobKeeper during the last nine months, during this very difficult time, uh, who have received their $700 a week, uh, who have been able to get on with their lives, who have been able to have some certainty that they can pay their mortgage and put food on the table, you might be tempted to think that you owe the Liberal government for paying you this stimulus package during this difficult time. But it's really important for you to know that this wasn't the Liberal government's idea. It was many people coming together to find a solution at a time of crisis. And I'm very proud to say that the Greens were the first to raise the concept of a living wage and push, at that particular time, the Treasurer and the Finance Minister to adopt a New Zealand or UK-style living wage that ended up being JobKeeper. The union movement were out there advocating for a living wage. The business community were advocating for a living wage. And we had this very unique time in history when everyone was working together for the national interest. I remember uh, putting out a media release the day of the government's first stimulus package saying exactly this. You need to go further. You need to have a living wage to keep businesses going, to keep workers in certainty during this pandemic. It took two weeks, two weeks for the government to come on board with the idea. And you know what? I'm very glad they did. But they can't be claiming credit for this scheme that has kept the economy going for the last nine months. Now, it's not perfect. Nowhere near enough people got it. It was cruel and unfair in many ways that cohorts were excluded for political reasons. Uh, and there was a lot of other problems with it, but let's be, let's be honest, it was a difficult time. We've never done this before. We should all be proud in this place of how we had cooperative politics and we worked for an outcome. We need to be very clear from here that we're not out of the woods yet, not by a long shot. While government regulations are in place around travel, around border closures, around restrictions, small business will still suffer. Workers will still suffer. We need to give them certainty. We need to let them know that we've got our backs. And I'm prepared to work with anyone in this chamber across political lines to make sure that happens. Let's keep the cooperative politics at the heart of what we do, not political conflict. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. There is a clear need for this government to explain how rebadging this inadequate loan scheme will be good enough for the tens of thousands of struggling small businesses that are indeed staring down the barrel of JobKeeper cuts uh, on March 28. This is the government's third attempt uh, at its SME loan scheme, a scheme that is already proven to not be working. 
The Treasurer has said it would help small business stand on their own two feet as we recover. However, what we see here is a government that's prepared really to push small business in Australia further into debt. Now we know that financing is uh, important and access to finance, but we also know that in with this lumpy response that's been given by the government that they've been have been pushed into needing to do, that this particular solution uh, isn't working particularly well so far. Uh, and indeed I can't see it playing a meaningful role given uh, the government's inadequate explanation of the scheme's role. The Treasurer has been disingenuous. He says it's about small business standing there on two feet, when indeed the government is uh, stimulating uh, their activity by pushing them into greater debt. The government's guaranteeing a high proportion of the loan, uh, the 50-50 split with banks shift to a, an 80-20 split. But as we know, taking on more debt will only be good if you can pay it back. So holidays uh, from debt repayments, etc., while uh, they can be important, they simply do not lift the economic burden off these small businesses uh, in a way that's meaningful. Nothing more is being done for small business than allowing them to be pushed into more significant debt. There is no direct funding support anymore with the end of JobKeeper. So why is this unpopular inadequate scheme being extended? The government promised some $40 billion in small business assistance, but the government has confirmed in its own figures that only $3 billion has been lent under the existing scheme over the last year. We know that the revised scheme opened in October. It extended the loan terms and loan size, and only 39 lenders signed up. The second version, there are now only 44 lenders signing up. Um, since the August, uh, revised August scheme, there's been th fewer than 3,000 new loans worth less than $300 million uh, under the new terms to January 20 of this year. We know that JobKeeper has been cut on March 28. The Morrison government is cutting this direct support and asking small businesses to take on further debt to continue to employ people from already a grossly undersubscribed scheme. So I think the government needs to be seen to point to something, that it's doing something. Uh, uh, it's going to say, oh, well, we've got this loan scheme as we end JobKeeper. Oh, well, uh, but what we also know is that with JobKeeper ending, the job seeker pay rates have also uh, now been headed right back down pretty much to just about what they were before. This is not economic stimulus for our nation. It is not wage growth for our nation that would see small businesses are benefiting from boosted consumption in our nation. We have made every effort to help small businesses and continue to do so in the Labor Party. We do want this version of the scheme to work better than the last, but we believe very strongly that we also need direct support. What the government is offering is not a lifeline for small business. It's a debt sentence. Small business and their workers deserve a real plan from this government, a comprehensive plan to help them through this health pandemic that's limiting economic activity in our nation, not a promise of more debt. The Reserve Bank governor has predicted some job shedding once JobKeeper ends, and for these workers and these employees of businesses, indeed these very businesses, there are many that simply won't make it. They'll be on this manifestly inadequate uh, job seeker amount. A third version of this thank unpopular you, scheme is simply Perhaps not good enough. Expired. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much, um, Acting Deputy President. And I would like to commend Labor for finally acknowledging our small business community. I mean, this is the same party that last election offered nothing for small business except more union power and increased cost of doing business. Since that election, uh, 
Small business has not featured in Labor's policy manifesto whatsoever, and yet here they are today proclaiming to be the champions of small business. But as usual, Labor are being opportunistic and unrealistic. They would have us indefinitely fund JobKeeper at the expense of real business support mechanisms, mechanisms we have put in place to create jobs. And indeed, we heard today from uh, Senator Birmingham that over 800,000 jobs have been created in Australia in the last six months alone. Because unlike Labor, we have a history of supporting small business. Ever since the coalition came back to power in 2013, we have delivered a range of policies and initiatives to make it easier to establish, operate and grow small businesses in Australia. Our policies enabled small businesses to create over 1.5 million new jobs between 2013 and the start of the pandemic. And as a national, I know all too well that our regional economies, in particular, are almost entirely dependent on small businesses, from farmers to boutiques, bakeries to consultancies, hairdressers and plumbers. Our small businesses keep our economy and our communities going. COVID has been particularly crippling, particularly in the regions. These are regions almost untouched by the pandemic itself, but have faced the same lockdowns, the same business clo closures and the same restrictions that have been imposed to um, manage the pandemic in urban areas. And for border communities in particular, the haphazard state-imposed border lockdowns and restrictions that have come off and on and off again have been particularly crippling. It's made it impossible for businesses to try and manage and plan for the future. And they've done so with no state compensation whatsoever, except for New South Wales, who established the Southern Border Small Business and Support Grant. And I commend the New South Wales government for recognising the impact that state uh, restrictions have had on our small businesses. At the beginning of the pandemic, our government understood that our economic recovery would be dependent on the thousands of small businesses across our nation. That's why we swung into action to support them throughout. And our measures have worked. And JobKeeper was only one of those measures, and it was always temporary. The other measures we've put in place, tax credits for small businesses. Over 800,000 small businesses re received $35 billion in tax credits. Uh, Labor likes to talk about the cut to JobKeeper, but let's talk about the real cuts, the tax cuts. 30 to 26 per cent for turnovers of less than $50 million and the personal income tax cuts. These are the cuts that put money back into people's pockets. The $4.9 billion tax relief through temporary loss carryback, which allows companies to write off their bad years against good years. So important after the year that was. And yes, the Small and Medium Enterprise Loan Guarantee Scheme, and I thank Labor for highlighting this very good and very popular policy. It has already supported 35,000 loans worth more than $3 billion for our small businesses. The improvements and the extensions we're making to this scheme are wanted, have been asked for and will succeed. We must remember JobKeeper was always targeted and temporary. It was there to see us through the worst of the pandemic. And thankfully, our worst has been nothing like the worst seen in other nations. And thankfully, Australia, due to our good management of the pandemic, is ready to rebuild. And as we rebuild, our government will continue to support small businesses. And I remind anyone listening the best way they can support small business is to buy local, support local, support your small businesses, get a coffee from the cafe, get your hair done down the street and support your local small business. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I ask an associated question, a connected question, yet a far bigger question. My question is, even if loan scheme is adequate, what about the big picture, restoring our productive capacity in this country? 
Look at our electricity prices, fundamental for manufacturing, fundamental for agriculture in many areas. Energy is the key. It's the primary driver of productive capacity. We've gone from the lowest cost of electricity in the world to the highest cost. It makes us uncompetitive. Liberal, Labor and the Nationals did that together. Renewable energy target, retail schemes, state and federal this is, N the network, gold-plated networks, the national electricity market, which is really a national electricity racket, privatisation, anti-coal policies from Liberal, Labor and Nationals. Taxation. Joe Hockey said not so long ago, people work from January to June to pay the tax man and for the rest they keep for the rest of the year. It's actually worse than that. It's about 68 per cent according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics back in the late 90s, early 2000s. A person on the, on the average income in Australia works from Monday to Smoko on Thursday morning just to pay for rates, fees, levies, taxes, supercharges, all the rest of it. So we need to do something about that, especially when 90 per cent of our large companies are foreign owned and since 1953 have paid little or no tax. Overregulation, control, uh, control of, of so many of our assets, the public, uh, private assets in the hands of government. The Fair Work Act, for example, which I'll talk about later. The lack of water infrastructure, the governance of, of this country, the Murray-Darling Basin destroying the Murray-Darling Murray -Darling Basin Authority, destroying the Murray-Darling Basin itself. Property rights, the loss of those under the Liberal, Labor and Nationals regimes. These and so many other things are destroying the governance of our country and the productive capacity. Governance in this country now is, ba is based upon vested interests, satisfying vested interests, unfounded opinions, emotions, fears, ideology, and not based on data. It's quite often contrary to the data. The loan scheme may or may not be inadequate for Australia, for Australian businesses and workers, but the mountain we all have to climb here is stupid, reckless, counterproductive government. We need to restore our country's productive capacity. The time for discussion has expired. I shall now